Hey, what's up? Welcome to the eighth episode of Movie Dumpster. We're talking about Sukiyaki Western Django today, directed by Takashi Miike from 2007. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor. Who won the White McGraw? Welcome to the dumpster. Their story goes a little something like this. The sound of the Guillaume Georgia Temple Bells echoes the impermanence. Of all things. What better do you say? I don't know. I don't. I just don't know. I don't know anything. I don't know what I watched. I don't know what it was about. I I got lost. I went to the bathroom and came back and was like, I have no idea what's happening. Way back when, when this movie first came out, Sean and I were, were playing with the idea of doing this show as well. We we love Takashi Miike, and you know we love me too. <laughs> yeah, like Itchy the Killer and Audition and shit. Like that's where we're like, okay, he's got a new flick coming out. It's called Sukiyaki and Django. Oh, and Quentin Tarantino's in it. Oh man, this is gonna be awesome. So we picked it up and uh, we were like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> what? How? What? What is going on here? I discovered Miki probably after a recommendation from you. Honestly, I saw most of Itchy the Killer. I saw Izo, his his three extremes entry, a whole bunch of other stuff. By the way, if you haven't seen Izo, it's a fucking trip. That. That movie's nuts. Have you seen Gozu? No, I haven't. And I started watching Blade of the Immortal recently, and that's pretty cool so far. I want to check out 13 Assassins as well. That too. Um, And then sat down with this, and then within like 25 minutes, I was like, I truly don't know what's happening. Okay, so let's uh, let's give the uh, synopsis real quick here. So we have two warring factions, right? The Genji and the Haiki. And they take over this town where there's a purported uh, gold stash, right? And this drifter comes to town and essentially is like, hey, I'm a badass killer and I'm gonna either be on the Heike side or the Genji side, but you're gonna have to give me half the gold. Or he makes a deal with one of the, one of the factions to, to, to be a part of it. See, I only caught like maybe 50% of that just sitting down watching it in front of my eyeballs. We watched this twice. Uh, back when it came out, we watched it fir- the first time cold. Oh, okay. And then we watched it with subtitles. <laughs> and then I watched it last night. And um, oddly enough, I kind of liked it last night. Yeah. No, I-, I actually liked it a lot more than I think I did when I watched it 10 years ago. Well, because I knew what to expect this time. So I was like, all right, you know, we have all of these Japanese actors speaking English for fucking God knows why. Yeah, what was, does anybody know why this was done? My guess was just like, that was the aesthetic he was going for. And I think it hits sometimes and other times it's just like, like, this actor wasn't equipped with the the right uh, way to say this. It creates this thing that's completely unique. And first of all, it also takes place in a town called Nevada. It, in Utah. <laughs> it's a cool idea, okay? So what we're doing here is essentially putting... We're, we're smashing, like, an Akira Kurosawa film and, like, a Sergio Leone film. And we're smashing them together, okay? You got your spaghetti western and your, and your samurai epic. Well, hence the name, right? So everything's so fucking literal and kind of, like, making fun of the those movies to an extent yeah because it's like this is sukiyaki western django and it's like spaghetti western like the italians were doing and it borrows a lot of shit from like fistful of dollars and you know the man with no name trilogy and um yojimbo and all that stuff i don't know if this is where you're going with it but like it doesn't know if it's a comedy or if it's serious or if it's like that's what i was gonna say like i think Mike like knows exactly what he's doing and instead of making something that more into it's like when somebody makes an 80s movie now and they they think it's all like side ponytails and smoking weed. Right. This movie isn't self aware enough. I think it's too self aware. I think it, it. Well, here's the thing: like you get like the, you get wacky shit like everything you just listed, and then you get like you know Takashi Miki's general contempt for humanity through his displays of horrifying graphic violence. Yeah, which are totally like out of place. <laughs> yeah. But like it's got some great action, has some great uh gunplay and sword play, but then it's just like muddled up with this horse shit. <laughs> Like, why is Quentin Tarantino even fucking there? Okay. You know, that's part of the reason why I even bring up saying, like, they didn't know if we wanted to be serious or a comedy. Like, I don't have a problem with, like, genres mixing. It's just the way that it goes from, like, Kung Fu Hustle to fucking Itchy the Killer. Yeah, but, like, Kung Fu Hustle knows exactly what it is. Right, but I'm just, yeah, I'm specifically talking about the tone. Quentin Tarantino shows up as, like, the first person you see and completely assassinates, like, any kind of idea of what this movie will be because you're like, oh, there's Quentin. 
Oh, he's got a really bad southern accent. Oh my god, what is he doing? And then all of a sudden, he's a, he's a, he's a blatant racist. He is doing what I've been calling a yellow voice. Yellow voice? <laughs> yellow voice. It is... Originated by Mickey Rooney. It's horrible. <laughs> yes. But it's worse than that. It's somehow worse. Because it's Quentin Tarantino, it's like, Motherfucker, you know better. I know you know better. He just doesn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's just get into it. So, okay, we open up on Quentin Tarantino, and he's making some kind of food over a fucking campfire, and a snake eats an egg and then gets taken by a hawk, and he shoots the fucking hawk out of the sky and grabs his snake and, like, cuts an egg out of him. That's very anime. It's so anime. But it's like, well, we'll get to that later, but... but no. <laughs> yeah, that really pissed me off, by the way. So, he takes this snake and he cuts the egg out of it, these outlaw guys or whatever you want to... Ruffians. Ruffians, yeah. They, they come rolling up. He looks like... The one guy looks like fucking Riff Raff from Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> he kind of reminds me of Chop Top. The way I read that whole scene was that it was just a call back to Once Upon a Time in the West. Like the opening scene of that movie. Yeah, but it's done like a fucking joke. Done like a stage play. The, the, the background is a wall. <laughs> Which is kind of cool because it like again like we're mixing it up with like the old style matte paintings like from the old Japanese movies and the old uh, spaghetti western stuff, which is cool, but it's just not done in a good way. Which is surprising because I'm like Mike, what the fuck are you doing? Well, what happens there, and then they go back to the scene once more, and then everything else is like a big giant open landscape. You're like that's all real. So he's about to get his head blown off by these by these outlaw ruffian guys, and he's like, hold on a second, let me tell you a little story. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story about these two factions of Japanese people. And then all of a sudden, he breaks out into this fucking, in, into what Connor has uh, affectionately called the yellow accent. Yellow voice. Yellow voice, excuse me. It's pretty, it's like insane. And he's just like, the sound of the temple bells rang out. Yeah. You can't make out half of what he's saying because it's, it's appalling. And it's not like, it's not a sentence, it's a monologue. Yeah, and this goes on for like five fucking minutes. You can't understand what he's saying. And I don't know if that's supposed to be the gag or the point, but it's fucking dumb. Anyway, he's giving you the backstory about the Heike and the Genji clans that had a few, had a war, the Genpai War, excuse me, Genpai War, from like, the 1100s in Japan. It was, I read, I read, I looked up this too. It's like right before samurai dominance is what it was worded as. And they took that and they put it in a Western setting, which is kind of cool, I guess. But it's supposed to be, this is supposed to be 700 years after that. So that war ended in 1185. Well, they say only say a few hundred. I don't think they ever say 700. I thought it sp explicitly said 700. Where did I get that nah, from? Nah, very loosely a few hundred years. I mean... That, that's all they say. So it's like, what, 1785, 1885? Maybe. I don't know. We're right in the pocket right there. Yeah. I mean, either way, it's not that long. Is it here or somewhere else where War of the Roses is also basically one of the main influences? That goes into it, too. Um, I'm not really familiar with War of the Roses, though. Me neither, and I should, because, like, weird romantic warfare is kind of one of my things. That's why I love Dynasty Warriors so much, because I'm like, these three kingdoms just beat the fuck out of each other for 300 years. But yeah, it's like this and it's that. And it it's also, like you said, this samurai movie and a Western dojo. So now like, I think up front you have four influences being thrown at you. You know, which is on one hand kind of cool. Like if you're into all the things they're referencing, I'm sure you would enjoy this movie like a lot more. Because you'd be like, oh, that thing, that thing. Oh, that's cool. But for like me, I don't really like I get like what they're talking about. But I don't actually know the material. I mean, I know spaghetti westerns. But other than that. If you don't know your Japanese history, like you don't even get the gist of it. Right, right. Also being told through his horrible voice. So you really can't make out what's happening anyway. That's why you gotta watch it with the subtitles. I, I didn't have the luxury of subtitles. So for most of this movie, I'm like, I don't know what that person said. I don't know what that person said. I got half of what that person said. I got nothing of what Quentin said. <laughs> <And> <laughs> He's probably the worst. And you have like native Japanese speakers speaking like broken Western American English. I do love, I, I mentioned this in the chat the other day, the, dude, the, the white haired dude. Every time he spoke, it looked like a physical struggle was happening his mouth and chin are going everywhere i'm like the faces he is making to get these words out yeah it's like who won the right and then his fucking his bottom lips go all the way down to his jawbone like that's what i'm saying like are we supposed to be laughing at this listen if this film was in japanese it would be a good movie I would really like it, actually. I'd like it a lot, but it's not. And it's just played for fucking laughs. And that pisses me off. There's a lot of good elements of this flick. I don't think 
English is some of these people's second language, let alone their first or second or third. Like, some of these people look like they had a lot of trouble. And I don't blame them. It's not their fault. Yeah, and I, and I mean, there's definitely some actors in this film that I think actually pulled off pretty well, you know, all things considered. But, like, to Joe's point, like, I agree. I would have probably enjoyed it a lot more if they were just speaking Japanese, but I'm sure other people might argue that, well, no, like, the whole point was that they were speaking in English. No, I get it. It's just stupid. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work as intended, for sure. That would be like, okay, I'm going to make a Godzilla movie, right? But all of my American actors are going to speak Japanese. That would be the fucking trippiest thing. I think I might pay to see that. It would be a piece of shit, though. Oh, I'm, I'm aware of that. But can you imagine Matthew Broderick speaking in Japanese? No. <laughs> I mean, how do you say that's a lot of fish in Japanese? <laughs> so Quentin takes us through this horrible narration and then uh, fucking does some anime shit and cracks this egg into a bowl and stirs it dramatically. And then we linger on a shot of Quentin eating this snake or steak or something like that. It's his sukiyaki. For way too fucking long. I'm like, are they just waiting for him to finish so he can speak? Because it's I'm uncomfortable. I mean, half the time he's making the dish, he's just stirring the eggs and then he just plops the beef right in there. He does. And I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> So he eats this fucking beef and he like chews for like a minute and a half. And then he's just like. Ah! And then the fucking titles come up and I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? That's the first five minutes of the movie. And it's it's almost nothing like the rest of the movie, which my, I don't know what. Cu- There's two cuts. Apparently, the one I watched was over two hours. Oh, you watched the original. Holy shit. You watched the original cut then. Oh, OK, then. <laughs> There's two cuts of this film. There's the Japanese cut that's like 121 minutes. It's like two hours and change. And the uh, the international cut is only like an hour and 30 minutes. The one I saw was 138 minutes with credits. That's even longer. No thanks. I think halfway through I was like, holy fuck, this movie's long. Yeah, I can only like stomach like an hour of it. Well, actually, maybe I did watch the long cut. I don't know. It was late last night. No, it's an hour and 38 minutes. What are you talking about? Which? The one that I watched. Yeah, I know. But then there's the long cut that's two hours and change. Oh, but I'm saying, what did Connor say? Did he say he watched the hour and 38 minute one or the two hour and eight? Oh, wait, wait, wait. I think I watched, never mind. It was the hour and 38 minute one. I think I misread something as I think I misread something as 138 minutes. I was like, oh my god! All right, I think we all watched the same one. Oh, uh, okay, I see what you mean. The Japanese cut is is two hours, so I don't even know what the fuck they cut. But this movie's dragging ass in a lot of spots. It does. This is where are we kind of what is this? The, the gunslinger comes to town like right away. So our man with no name strolls in. I think he's even credited as just the gunman. I don't think that he ever gets a name. I read the Wikipedia plot summary afterwards. He's not named once. He's just the gunman. So he rolls in and it's like your classic like Western kind of standoff. Both the Genjis and the Heikis come out of their hideouts. If that's what you want to call. I'm so wait, who? I saw I saw the boppers and the hi hats from the Warriors both come out. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I saw a bunch of fucking flamboyant motherfuckers come out of those fucking buildings. <laughs> Who's the leader of the whites? His his English was like almost perfect. Uh Yoshimitsu, yes. Or is, no, that's the guy from Tekken. <laughs> Yoshitsune. I think it's pronounced Yoshitsune. Yeah, I think that's probably more accurate. If I'm up to date on my Japanese names after watching Japanese wrestling for so fucking long. Because I, ha- I have been totally caught mispronouncing things at shows featuring Japanese people. They're uh, they're all very amused. The boss of the Hike is... Uh... Kiyomori. Or, excuse me, Henry. <laughs> okay, is that the gag that kept happening? Because he was like, that's not my name halfway through the movie or something. Like, my name is Henry. Okay, that makes more sense now. So the gunman, he's like surrounded by the two gangs as they come out of their little castles or whatever they're supposed to be. Like one of them's in like the bar slash hotel. That's where the Genji come out of. It looks like they're both in like, they're both in like salons that are like on opposite corners of the same town. That's got to be a little complicated. I want to go to a bar, but I have to make a, an allegiance. If, if do I go to the red bar or the white bar? Yeah. <laughs> They're actually pretty cool. They're they're like these saloons, but they're like fashioned after like Japanese architecture. They're pretty awesome, actually. They look like temples, and then surrounding them are like dingy Western shacks. Like, so. and this is where I think I just started to lose my way because I was like, "All right, there he is. I'm assuming he's gonna have to pick one of these two. And then after that, movie lost. Me. Which he kind of does. So he sides with uh the Genji at first. Yeah, because he like he's crashing at their place, isn't he? He does eventually. At first, he's kind of like he hasn't made up his mind yet the character uh ruriko comes out a little bit older woman and she's like oh you know you don't have to decide if you're gonna join this side or this side like yeah you know put your feet up think about it a little because i think the genji say you know okay you're here to look for the gold well you can have it all but you need to work for us the rest of your life and the hike are like hey you can only have half but it's a one-time deal that's an easy choice and uh basically like puts his feet up 
and he and he goes, you know, uh, what's the story with this town? Like, why? What's with these gangs taking it over? And she basically uh, explains that originally their clan was all uh, Hike, but they kind of kept to themselves. They weren't really part of the gang. They just like came from that uh, clan of warriors, and uh, everything was peaceful. And then the fucking 49ers showed up. <laughs> so you got the gold diggers there looking for gold, like just like just like beating the shit out of this town, just trying to find the little speck. They're all trying to lay claim to the gold or whatever, like you know, overrun the overrun the town, take control of the town. They get they get the control of the gold, right? Because apparently a, a neighboring town had a rumor that there was gold hidden in it, and it was found. And now like apparently there was also a rumor in this town that there's gold. So now they're all like coming into like, oh, if it happened there, it's got to be true here. So the so the gold diggers. They're, like, fucking the town up, like, being a nuisance. So the Hike come in, like, under the guise of, like, oh, we're gonna take care of these guys. And they, you know, they beat the shit out of them and kick them out of town. But then, like, the Hike, you know, the boss is like, uh, actually, no, we're gonna look for that gold because, uh, we're, we're bad dudes. Yeah, and, but what's fucked up is that they're, that's their people as well, so. Exactly. You have, like, uh, the scene with the old man, the mayor. Basically, he's, like, pleading with them to leave and they just, like, fucking drag him through town and hang him like at the edge of town okay so that's what happened there yeah and the sh- that's also the scene with the sheriff uh just like after that stuff starts to go down like they basically grab him and are like you're with us now and he's just like oh uh, i needed a new uh plot in life he's like no problem he's an interesting character he might be my favorite character in the movie up to a certain point just because of how ridiculous he is. I took the sheriff. His name's Gollum. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I wrote down. I was going to say, yeah. And this is where uh, Romeo and Juliet is basically introduced into the plot now, too. Yeah, well, the Genji roll into town, and they're like, hey, they're going to take the town from the Heike. And they're like, uh, you know, we'll fight you for it or whatever. And they kind of just rolled in, and they set up shop. They don't start any shit, and they're basically just like, yeah, as soon as uh, as soon as you guys find the gold, we're just going to kill you all and take it. So they let them do all the work, essentially. Ruiku's son comes home. Her son, Akira, he comes home, and he has hitched up with a Genji girl, and she's pregnant. And she um, actually accepts that, that the, that the two dynasties are are you know, kind of intermingling. He has her blessings, and, and they and she lets him stay at the house, and they have their son, uh, Hihachi. Mishima. <laughs> this one not throwing Kazuya in a volcano. That we know yeah. of. <laughs> Damn it! Beat me to it! <laughs> I'll get one later. Anyway, this story, this little love story continues until the Hike leader, Kiyomori, shoots the fuck out of Akira. Good God! He's dead within the first two shots. And then, like, he just keeps picking body parts to shoot. I'm like, yeah, okay, this is definitely a Takashi Miki movie now. So Shizuka's holding Akira, and she's like, Kiyomori's just, like, blowing holes in Akira. He's just he's just unloading, like, like basically his entire, it's what well, it would be a clip, it'd be a fucking chamber, I guess. Every bullet he has, and, like, back, chest head head again i think chest i'm like he's dead stop it and it's all exploding onto her and i thought that was like oh my god like it was shot really really well but then it's just kind of all for naught and then it and then it segues into an attempted rape scene you're like oh (laughs) yeah what the fuck oh god and that's what you said this movie's totally all the place where it's like it's kind of wacky and then it goes oh each of the killer okay you know that whole antithesis of a curating kill is because he like finally stands up to them he's like oh like get the fuck out of here like we don't need you and you know that's like the thing that triggers kiyomori and then he's like oh okay i killed you now i'm gonna rape your wife it's like okay like meanwhile the fucking son is just like standing there watching all this and then he ends up not being able to talk because he watched his father like die in the street and the most fucked up part about that is you know then she runs to the genji basically like hey you know i am you know part of this clan of this uh you know group essentially however you want to word that yeah clan dynasty whatever yeah and they bring her in under the pretense of okay well now you're a prostitute and then fucking yoshitsu um just like rapes her. Uh, yeah, as that's happening, she looks out the window and sees them dump her husband's corpse in like a fucking gutter. While she's getting fucked by this dude. And then her son comes up and is just like looking at her her dead husband in the gutter. It's pretty dark. It is really dark. It's really dark. But then like, like within 30 minutes, you're like, ha ha, dynamite, cigarettes, all kinds of weird gags. Which, I mean, honestly, like for him is kind of light but doesn't make it any less serious oh totally i think isn't isn't like the first like two minutes of each of the killer feature someone jacking off into a window yep <laughs> i like the fact that someone can say that with such casualness it's fucking mickey whatever so basically she she goes there and gives her gives herself to the genji 
in so that they can get revenge on uh, the Heike for killing Akira. And all the while, hey, he- has been taking care of a trio of red and white roses. Uh, I guess waiting for the day they bloom. Well, yeah, because that's that's what their love signified was the unification of the two factions, and the kid is half. Uh, Heike and half Genji, and the roses kind of represent that as well, because they bloom red and white. This is the War of the Rose reference. I actually looked it up earlier. Uh, it was a civil war in England, I believe, and I think each opposing side, I think it was a red rose and a white rose with basically the sigils of each side. Well, there you go. So that's what we're doing here. We're, we're combining War of the Roses and the Genpai War together. Yeah, more or less. Uh, and then I think the gunmen won some kind of challenge? Wait, we have the horde dance first. Oh my god, this went on for so fucking long. Also, not to go I, I want to go back a minute during this whole flashback sequence with the whole the whole mining town. Did someone get shot in the flashback and turn around and say, Oh, dead. Definitely. <laughs> I appreciate that a lot. The uh, the Genji roll in, and some dude from the Heike comes, and he's like, he gets all fucking, he gets all, he puffs his chest out, and then someone blows a literal like tennis ball size hole in him, and then he turns around, and he goes, oh, dead. And then the other guy shoots a fucking arrow through the hole, and then kills the guy behind him. That's why I can't hate this movie because it offers me stupid shit like that. And then to address what we just said, like, you have this, and then horrifying murder and rape. Exactly. Within minutes of each other. So, Rory Crow, she finishes telling that story, and then the next scene, you jump to uh, the Genji's uh, saloon, where the boss is basically talking about, uh, you know, violence, and, you know, their warrior code, and he uh, basically is, is telling one of his men to swing a sword at another man and be like, you know, don't be afraid. Oh, this shit too. Oh my god. He goes, tits, tits on the bull thinking. I'm not sure what that meant, but... Uh, <laughs> me neither. So then, like, the guy's scared. He won't do it. So he's like, uh, let me take care of this. And he walks up, and he's got this, uh, what would you even call it? Like, just a long sleeve, uh, like, cotton shirt on. And he just starts unbuttoning it for no reason. And then he takes, like, the right arm out and it's just like half the shirt is undone and he's like all right swing it and then he just fucking catches the sword and i was like oh okay so it's cool you caught the sword but like what the fuck was the point of like taking half of your shirt off because he has because he has to look like akuma from street fighter before that he's like talking about how the samurai are like shit and like this new way this new fighting style is like way better um like he's like the samurai is like a way of life or something like that and this is like an actual um art of war rather or something, something, something to that extent. So he catches the blade, and he has this other guy come up who looks like he's already been fucking cracked a couple times in the head because he's got like a. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah, because he's got a bandage around it. He's scared as shit. Well, I noticed all of them kind of had bandanas, but his looked especially thick. I fucking love this gag. I love everything about this scene. <laughs> so the guy's like, he gets up the balls and he closes his eyes, and the guy comes at him with the sword and fucking plants it right in his dome, and then he just fucking claps. <laughs> And then he, he goes to catch it, like, he just claps up his head, like, four times and dies. He just keeps clapping. <laughs> I'm like, it's not funny. He has brain damage. Oh, he's clapping more. This is really funny. Yeah, and, and, and then the boss just goes over, grabs the sword, puts it away, pulls out his gun, and shoots him in the head. I'm a big fan of, like, gunslinging samurais. Like, that shit is fucking so cool to me. And it's just kind of wasted here. You know what I mean? You get a, f- a few cool scenes uh, with uh, Yoshitsu. And that's it. Like, th- this whole scene right here, like, when he takes the fucking sword and, like, puts it away and then, like, whoops out the gun, but he, like, does all this fancy gun work and then fucking blows this dude away. I don't know. It's just, it's so cool, and I wish it was in a better movie. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's one of my issues with it, is that there's a lot of stuff I liked that was in a vacuum entertaining, but the long slog is... Just, like, cut cut all of the action scenes together, and there you go. And just put it to the William Tell Overture and nothing else. Or the Benny Hill music. <laughs> um, so next, you get, we, we, we go back to our boy Kiyomori, and he's walking around reading, basically reiterating what Quentin said in the beginning of the movie, but, like, a little bit more articulated, um, which is basically, you know, like we said, the retelling of this battle that happened several years ago. And none of his men seem interested, so he breaks out the fucking Shakespeare. And he's just like, he's like, they're like, what book is that? He's like, Henry VIII. He's like, from now on, I will be called Henry. So now this all of a sudden makes more sense. See? I knew this was going to happen. I know. <laughs> you were treating my guides to this fucking wacko fest. Uh, is this where we lead up to the Gatling gun stuff? Uh, that's a little bit further down. This is the scene that you referenced earlier. Good God! <laughs> There's a bunch of shit in the middle of this. 
Because <laughs> I'm already jumping there too. That scene finishes that. I think like something else happens in that scene that's like inconsequential. I think one of his men calls him like Kiyomori and he gets pissed. He does. I remember that. Just- and he fucking headbutts him or kicks him or some shit. Uh, he was, I don't know. I, I don't know if that guy was the best actor, but I kind of like his character quite a bit, even though he's a shithead, like to the extreme. Like, as a character, I thought he was interesting. I found him very amusing by the end of this. Even if he did some really fucked up shit, like, in the first half hour. Yeah. Well, I had forgotten all about that because this movie takes so goddamn long, so I'm just laughing at it by the end. So you go from that to the scene that you guys referenced earlier of Shizuka doing this, like, really sexualized dance, like, in the saloon. It's literally the prostitute dance, and there's this guy outside with a fucking drum and a didgeridoo. <laughs> And it's kind of cool, like, actually, it's kind of neat, but it's completely pointless. It's cool to watch, but you're like, "Eh, we're like minute three of this, I'm not really sure where it's going. And then she pulls fucking bells out of her mouth, and I'm like, is that, is that supposed to represent the temple bells? Maybe. I mean, I, I, the thing, the thing that I grabbed from that scene that I think was important was the idea that she still misses her husband, that she hasn't forgotten. I think that was the bigger point because she kind of sees like one of the like right because she sees a uh, it was Akira right and she sees him and then it pans reality and it's just like schleppy looking dude. Yeah, like one of the bosses, like right hand guys, the arrow guy. Yeah, but like I don't know, like it was just like a little ham fisted just because I didn't need that like. The whole reason she went there was to avenge his death. Well, it was like a combination of that and just because she knew if she didn't do that, like, she would just be raped and murdered. Yeah, but that's essentially what she's doing. She's dancing. She's dancing, and then whomever tries to claim her has to fight another dude, and whoever wins that fight gets her for the night? Yeah, I guess, because that's when the gunman comes in. Because he's like, where's the woman? And now he, this is after the gunman finds out that she is, um... Akira's wife. Yeah, he he's already gotten basically the story about their whole situation from Riroku. And that's also the scene where he comes in and basically uh, the boss is like, I'm just going to keep calling him the boss because I don't want to keep fucking his name. <laughs> the Genji leader. He, uh, he, basically, he basically pulls his sword out and he's like, oh, you know, you're the second person that's ever made me want to draw ire just from like your presence. And he's like, oh, the second? Who's the first? And that's where he kind of goes into like this little story about this character, this this female legendary warrior called Bloody Benton, who's fucking badass, actually. Who is? Yeah, also my favorite part of the one of my favorite parts of the movie. Like, can I can I watch that movie, please? Because it looks a lot better than this. Yeah, but it, I feel like <laughs> you know, it felt like it felt like Wonder Woman's introduction introduction in Batman vs Superman at the end. Like, why? Is, this is awesome, but why is she here? <laughs> yeah, I, it doesn't really make any fucking sense at all so then the gunman has to fight um the arrow guy the guy with the fucking crossbow and he beats the fucking piss out of this dude he he gets to take uh shizuku home or out of there or he does you know whatever he wants to her which he ends up fucking her but you know (laughs) which i found disturbing after he heard this whole story about how how fucking messed up everything was that had happened and then it's just like He's like, do you want me? And she's like, yes, very much. I'm like, okay. That's so sad. Sex time. Well, she, w- I guess she just wants to make love to somebody that, like, hasn't forced her. <laughs> yeah, totally. She also she also just looks like, at this point, any form of, like, human contact that isn't completely malicious and intent is probably an upgrade, so. Well, I also, she's probably like, hmm, th- I know this dude's a fucking uber badass. Maybe this will help my chances in him helping me you know what i mean oh another another thing i want to just note before we forget about it when uh he's told the story of what happened with uh, akira in the town he has kind of like a flashback to something that uh, they don't ever really totally go into it but it's implied that he had a similar thing happened to him as a child yeah his parents were killed in front of him as well a lot of a lot of a lot of hanging in this movie <laughs> well it's the it's the old west it's kind of a corpse hanging from a tree every once in a while there's this weird fucking scene where she they're like taking their clothes off and she's totally like blowing him yeah <laughs> uh maybe this is when i stepped out to go to the bathroom yeah she's totally blowing him and they're like talking about her son and you like hear her sucking him off and he's like do you love blah 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 or hiachi i actually didn't write any notes down for that scene (laughs) it just stuck with me because i'm like like i thought she was gonna like go down and it was gonna cut but then all of a sudden you just hear sucking sounds and i'm like what the fuck why but that's him just like he he likes making the audience uncomfortable i know but it has no it has no place here that's when when you're reminded whose film you're watching yeah but that's what i mean like it's all like stuck in there it's like an overstuffed pillow with like all this horse shit in it 
it, and then there's like a little bit of like Takashi Miike stuff in there. It's like Miki took everything he had for this and just balled it up and threw it against the wall. He's like, that's what we're using. All right, fuck it. <laughs> I also think it was like the one scene that he had in the movie, like up to that point where those characters were interacting in a realistic scenario. And it was like, okay, well, and where, when else are they going to have this conversation? While she's blowing them though? <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. But she is like, you know, a prostitute as far as like they're concerned. All right. I mean, I get what you're saying, but like it could be after the blowjob. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I just think he did that because he wanted to get the exposition in there and have like a sexy scene. Yes, sexy. She tells uh, the gunman this secret that the Genji have this crazy weapon that they're they're bringing into town to kill all the Heike. So then he writes a note and gives it to her and tells her to give it to the sheriff. And the sheriff gets it. And this is our first time we're introduced to his schizophrenia. Yeah, his golem. Yeah, he's fucking golem. It's like the only thing you're missing is Samwise Gamgee walking in. It's, it's, it's like everyone in this movie has a quirk just to have a quirk. You know, so he's in the corner going, oh, me wants the precious. Well, well, he's like arguing with himself whether he should like tell them about this like this wagon that has this weapon or not. And it's like it goes on for like a solid minute of him basically with his ha- I, I, I said that this is what I wrote. I said the sheriff and his idle hands trying to do his best Gollum impression because it's the hand the hands like moving around like he's trying to do a fucking, you know, shadow puppet or something. Sheriff Strangelove. And he's making this high voice that sounds like this. It, it's bizarre. In, in a bizarre movie to begin with. It's just fucking wacky, just for the sake of being wacky. And he's shown none of these symptoms up to this point in the film. No, and I guess, like, I don't know, he's finally cracked or some shit. I don't know. I mean, unless he was just, like, this actor is like, Nick Cage, and he's just like, how much can I get away with? Put the bear skull down, Nick. Okay. Basically, this is, like, the mad dash sequence, I think, where we're like, the white gang is run. They have it, don't they, already at this point? Yeah, they, they have it in the wagon. They're running it back to town. So the sheriff finally tells uh, the hikey that, uh, the Genji are bringing this thing in, so they go out. They you know they go after him on horseback, um, and they're bringing the wagon in, which is full of dynamite. And this is the part that calls right back to Django. They have a fucking machine gun in a coffin that they're trailing behind the wagon. The wagon that is not being drawn by horses, but being pushed by like twenty slaves. Yeah, why? <laughs> And where did you get those slaves? Where did you get those slaves? Probably from the town. Which town? This, the town that they're in? The one that they're, they're occupying, I, that would be my guess. This was where I went to the bathroom and came back. Because I came back, I was like, are they tilling a field in a really stupid way? What's happening? And then, like, I saw the casket, and I'm like, did they dig fucking Akira up for some reason? What is going on? <laughs> yeah, there's a reference to that later. Don't worry, we'll bring it up. You have this, like, little homage in there to Django, and it's like, who could fucking care? Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's just stupid. It's out of place. Why are the Genji even bringing in that weapon in the first place? Nobody found the gold yet, anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess at that point, like, they're just, like, the competition between them has gotten so, such to, like, a boiling point, and that gunslinger came into town and just, like, fucking everything up. Also, couldn't you have some, uh, subtlety to your plan and not go about it with making as much fucking noise as possible? I don't know, wait till night, not have 20 people push your cart? In the original Django movie, like, Franco Nero is just pulling this fucking coffin into town by himself. That's rad. <laughs> the Heike are going after the Genji, and, you know, they're trying to kill him. They're trying to get whatever weapon they have. So the fucking Genji, the guy driving the driving the fucking cart, starts lighting fucking sticks of dynamite and throwing them at these guys and, like, blowing them off their horses and shit. Which I thought was actually pretty impressive looking because, like, there was these, you know... Not dynamite size, but, like, moderately sized explosions going off, like, right in these stunt dudes' faces, pretty much. I'm like, wow, that's, I'm like, that sucks, but that's cool. <laughs> the the action sequences are really cool, and I, and, and again, I, I can't stress enough, like, how much I want to like this fucking movie, but I just can't, because it doesn't let me. <laughs> it's, it forbids you. It, this is when I decided that I liked Kiyomori. So this, this, this carriage goes down, because I guess all the people who were pushing it got mur- murdered. Or does something else derail it? I can't remember. It lands in a fucking ditch and, like, flips over. Oh, the first of many ditch fucking accidents. The first of two instances where someone does this. It, it's not the leader of the Whites gang. I can't remember what his name is, but... Name's like, uh, Shigemori, I want to say. I think that's what that guy's name is. He goes down with his cart and then opens the casket, and it's a fucking old crank style gatling gun which is awesome and he points at the reds and kiyomori makes a sound and slowly falls off of his horse face plants the ground and just casually rolls to the side into the same ditch that the fucking cart hit and thus avoiding all the gunfire because it goes in a straight line which is why i think he ended up being one of my favorite characters even though he did all that horrible shit in the beginning of the movie he's a fucking coward yeah (laughs) 
through and through. Just like it, it, he stops. Paul. I thought he got shot at first because he eats shit off of this horse, which really had to suck. Like I don't care. Like because they, I think they show the fall. Obvi- yeah. Probably wasn't the actor, but like I think the thought is he saw that guy pull that Gatling out and just fucking fainted. <laughs> That's even better, because his recovery is to roll face first into, like, a small patch of dirt and rocks. He's definitely a coward, because throughout the whole movie, he's constantly shown, like, putting his men in front of him as shields. Like, that's definitely, like, his character trait. He's always grabbing people, and he's like, oh, I wish you were fatter, so you could protect me better. (laughs) So, uh, one of his men shoots the cart with dynamite in it with a flaming arrow, and it explodes. And the guy with the bear hat dies, and the Gatling gun, like, falls right next to Henry. And he's like, oh, lucky me. <laughs> he literally says that. <laughs> and this is when he picked up the movie and ran away with it, because every time he was on screen after this, I was clapping by hand. <laughs> well, meanwhile, while this is all going on is when um, Arrow Dude, I, I keep forgetting his name, but Arrow, I'll just call him Arrow Dude, Crossbow Dude, the gunman uh, basically had gone... And with uh, Shizuka and Hayachi and Ruriko and was like, hey, we need to get the fuck out of Dodge, like, because things are about to get bad. So as they're leaving, you know, Shizuka says, wait, no, we can't leave yet. I need something. And she runs back to the house and grab and let's like starts on digging the roses. She fucking eats one in the chest. And blows her heart out. She gets hit with a crossbow, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, because her... Okay, we just talked about how fun and wacky this movie is, right? And then her death... She Her death scene is agonizingly long. It goes on forever. And then she just, like, after so much, you're like, maybe she'll, maybe she'll make it through. And then she just stops breathing. You're like, oh, fuck. I want to add one addendum to that that I forgot that I did write down. Before this horrible fucking situation starts to happen to these characters, the gunman is still in the uh, saloon. And basically, uh, boss... Uh, uh, Genji's like, oh, they fucking betrayed us, like, kill him. And they just start, like, shooting at the roof where he's staying. And uh, he jumps out the window, like, to get, land on his horse. And there's this insane, like, Terminator fucking shot of, like, the camera freeze frames on him and does, like, a zoom in a pan with, like, sound effects, like, do 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 and he lands on the horse, and then he gets away, and then and then that happens. I completely, I forgot about that, because when that happened, I was like, what the fuck is happening? Was it him, like, zeroing in on jumping on his horse's back? Yeah, it was like something out of fucking yesterday's target, man. It was something out of fucking naked gun. But that whole scene is kind of cool. Like, he's rolling out of the way, the bullets and all that shit, and he busts out the window and jumps on the horse. So to go back to the scene we were just talking about, like you guys were saying, it takes her forever to die. So, like, in the interlude, now that um, Henry has the Gatling gun and is trying to get away, then, uh... Uh, Yoshitsune shows up with his gun and the rest of the Genji and is just like, all right, we're not going to let that fucking happen. And he starts fucking curving bullets to hit this guy through the wind. Like, I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah, this, th- it was like something out of Metal Gear Solid. Using the fucking wind to aim your shots. Yeah, I thought that was kind of neat. Like, he was waiting for the wind to change and shit and he's just like shooting off into the distance and then he's just like fucking clipping this dude in the arm. And- I was laughing because like every time it fucking hit Kiyomori, I was giggling because just like, it's just like, ow, 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 ow. And I had forgot that he was wearing body armor. I'm like, why isn't this fucking guy dead yet? I didn't even know he was wearing body armor. So then, like, when his friend was getting shot and, like, is, like, exploding all the place, it added to the comedic effect. And it was the the one dude that was, like, calling him Henry, like, straight up. Like, his most loyal, you know, follower. Yeah, and he's just like, don't worry, we're gonna win this war. And he just leaves him to die. Oh, yeah, because he's like, as long as I'm alive, we're gonna win. Yeah. (laughs) Which is a super (laughs) shitty way of saying, only I matter, please die. So then we cut back to uh, the gunman getting his fucking ass whooped he shows up to save them but like there's three guns on him and he has two and the one the crossbow guy says either way someone dies which i thought was cool i'm like i'm like that's an interesting way to end a mexican standoff like no you lose and that's kind of why i think that they drag out shizuka dying a little bit because like the crossbow guy has like the gun to her head and she he and she's like no not hayachi not hayachi and then uh, this character shows up that I must have just missed the rest of the movie because yes. I did not even realize he was fucking there until now. Me neither. Toshio, the assistant to Ruriko, just fucking runs in and just starts, like, firing. And, uh, you know, immediately, like, the crossbow guy's henchmen go after him. Oh, that's right, because this is when th- he tosses the revolver to Ruriko who catches it and just wrecks everyone's shit. And we find out she's the goddess, Bloody Benton. And she's fucking badass. She's probably my favorite part of this whole movie. She blows these dudes away. Shizuka's fucking just, like, gasping for breath, and she's just got this fucking arrow through her. And Hihachi just is, like, crawling over to her with his eyes closed because he doesn't want to see her die like he watched his dad die. It's pretty fucking sad. Well, because then Ruriko grabs him and is like, you open your eyes right now and you face this. Or else you're going to be running from it your whole life. And then this is where I was like, this is where I was like, oh, someone will save her. And there she goes. Then I guess the gunman, he's getting 
they take him to be healed. Um, meanwhile, Toshio is sent by uh, BB to basically go find this dude that trained her. Yeah, to get some guns and shit like that. Oh, boy. <sighs> a character he possibly may have met already earlier in the film. Grandpa Quentin rolls up in a fucking wheelchair and lots of makeup and uh, uh, hair. He looks like the fucking guy from the Texas Chainsaw remake. <laughs> In the fucking wheelchair with the colostomy bag. Oh my god, that's awesome. And his name's Peringo. And then his accent changes again. He's like, yep, this, yep, bloody Benton. I'm like, who are you now? Like, are you, are you, are you Sling Blade now? The fucking wheelchair looks like it came out of fucking Wild Wild West. And Quentin Tarantino, at this point in his life, is what Patton Oswalt calls B-word fat. So it's... The bloody Benton is... <laughs> he looked like fucking Theoden before Gandalf saved his ass. <laughs> Something else it reminds me of is um uh, is fucking old ass Nicodemus in the Secret of Nim. Yes. So he's just he's waxing on with you know plot details that whatever like. <laughs> At this, at, at this point, I was like, just give me a shootout. We cut to, like, this cool, like, little anime sequence, and then it's, like, live action of uh, the goddess or, you know, Bloody Benton or Ruriko. She's just fucking mowing dudes down. What They they called her they called her the Eight Arms of Death or something like that? I wonder if that was the one scene that Tarantino filmed, if he did at all. I don't think he filmed any of it. Oh, because it was very, like, Grindhouse, and you know how big he is into that kind of stuff. Again, like, I, I wish I could have saw that movie. Like, this little scene is just like, oh, this is fucking sweet. Just seeing Bloody Benton just fucking waste all these dudes. I would have much rather Bloody Benton be introduced far earlier in the movie. Well, she was, technically. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, you know, what, what we knew as, you know, this badass gunslinger. So you find out basically in his, while he's waxing on about how he trained her when she was young and apparently they were lovers. That fucking scene made my skin crawl. Toshio goes, he's, oh yeah, Akira, that's your son. He goes, ah, yes, Akira was always in an, a, an anime otaku at heart. I was like, what the fuck? Oh my, f I missed that entirely. What the fuck? Did he just say anime otaku? And I'm like, it's fucking, it's supposed to be 1885. Can we get any fucking more meta <laughs> we gotta go back to 1885 fucking marty god damn it marty my question is how did he give him all these weapons if he's like in this wheelchair did i miss something or i was hoping to see him like press a fucking button like in men in black like in jesus shop and like all the fucking things turn over and it's all these different crazy guns but that doesn't happen Instead, he's just there for no reason. Like, we didn't even have to fucking see him. Well, I think that, I, I think he gets his scene, and then the next shot is the Genji burning down the Hike Temple with some fucking Star Wars sound effects. Joe, you mentioned, um, the, the scene that made your skin crawl. Is it the, uh, the flashback to younger Quentin from the beginning where he's, like, beating the fuck out of Eriko or something like that? Because the sukiyaki is not cooked right? Yes, that made my fucking skin crawl. I, like, I feel like that's just Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, that's the problem. You watch a Takashi Miki movie, and like, especially this one, you're like, does Takashi hate women? Then you're like, no, he just hates everybody. It's very obvious. He has pure disdain for humanity. It seems too real for me. Like, he's done that before. Well, this is the same man who insisted that he be the one to strangle Diane Kruger in Inglorious Bastards. So. You find out that she's like being trained by him. I see what they were kind of going for. The old kung fu movies or, or samurai movies were like, you where, had... where the, the master is very abusive, but there's, all, there's a higher meaning to it. Right, but. It's handled in a way here that's it's very like domestic abuse. Exactly. It shouldn't look like you just walked in on someone having a domestic like domestic violence issue. Yeah, it looks like it looks like he had a, a one six pack too many and just started fucking wailing off on her. It plays off like you walked into dad hitting mom. It's fucking frightening. <laughs> And I'm not laughing at domestic violence. I'm laughing because this is so fucking uncomfortable. There's no real other way to express. Yeah, it's completely out of place. I'm like, can we just get back to the other shitty movie, please? Thankfully, this doesn't last very long. And then we get into, you said, I'm sorry, Star Wars effects? Uh, it cuts to them basically burning down the, the, the Genji burning down the Hike's, uh, you know, saloon, temple, whatever the fuck it is. And there's just Star Wars sound effects going off in the background. I missed that entirely. It's like an at, -AT firing its weapon. It's like, when did the movie fall off the rails? Was it on them at all? Why did it wait so long? <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to remember what happens after that. I know that from that point, like, shit starts to really devolve. Everyone just starts killing each other at this point. Yeah, and that's where the gunman basically, he's all healed by, like, the medicine man. So, yeah, basically he says, like, you're healed, you can do what you want. And the gunman's like, all right, I'm going to go back to town. And they, he kind of makes a deal with BB. He's like, they're like, oh, you can have all the money. Or what they say, you can have half the money. Just help us, basically. And he's like, deal. Or half the gold. And then uh, she's like, oh, Toshio, get the gold. And he's like, wait, what? There's actually gold? And they have, like, this little debate. Like, oh, the town's not supposed to talk about it. And they break out uh, Captain Crunch's fucking secret stash. <laughs> it, it looks like toy prize money. 
It looks like shit you'd see at a mini golf course. It looks like, like those cheap ass candies at the fucking dollar store, those golden nuggets. The rest of the Genji come back to the town and then... Then the sheriff has one more fucking zany scene. First we're blowing people away, like, Kiyomori shows up first with like the fucking Gatling gun. He has a chain of people in front of him, doesn't he? Yeah, he has, the, he has the chain of people in front of him and then he sees the sheriff arguing with himself and he grabs him. He's like sleeping in the coffin and he like gets up. Yeah, and then they're walking down the fucking path and, and the sheriff is like, oh, you're gonna die, I'm gonna die, you're gonna die we're gonna die we're all gonna die everyone's gonna die yeah he's like singing right or some shit he's like we're all gonna die you're gonna die yeah <laughs> like sing songy about it he has like five people chained in front of him for a human shield but then like what is it they all duck and he fucking pulls the gatling gun out yeah he's like shooting the gatling gun and the sheriff like blows smoke out of his mouth and like falls to the ground because he's like so close to the gun falls in another ditch he, yeah he, he it's the same gag that uh kiyomura does he he just falls over and then slowly rolls into a ditch and just plays dead yeah, but we're going to, like, super serious shit to, like, this fucking Looney Tunes shit, and it's like... Yep. <laughs> it's still Looney Tunes, because then one of the Genji crawl around the side of a building to escape the gunfire, and the bloody Benton's, like, taking a leak. Oh, my God. I forgot about that. I'm like, wait, is she pissing? She's like, hold on. Yeah, she says, hold on, finishes, and then turns around and shoots the guy in the face. I wasn't sure if this was her setting someone up. Or if she was just legitimately taking a piss. I think she was legitimately supposed to be taking a piss. <laughs> God, God damn it. Yeah. Well, she's been drinking out of that flask the whole time. Then more Star Wars sounds effects. I gotta go back and look for those specifically. Yeah, man, because I didn't hear those. I don't. Like I said, I don't. I, it might be at -T, a t a t firing, or it might be like the sound that the the fucking spaceships make when they like exit like a, a, a like a fucking star destroyer. But it's it's I, it's Star Wars. It's such a weird thing to pull from. Fuck it, it's a mixed bag. This this fucking movie. It's everything. It's Star Wars. It's the Western too. Yeah. The gunfight gets out of control. I think at this point. Bloody Benton shooting people. Kiyomori shooting people. Um, yeah, the gunman shooting people. I believe Yoshitsune, the leader of the Whites, is shooting people. Yeah, it's just like a big bloodbath, and a lot of it's cool. It's it's choreographed pretty well. And it's kind of awesome. Yeah. I don't know if it's worth watching the whole fucking movie for, but it's pretty good. No, it's probably just worth watching just on YouTube by itself. Hey, that's how I, that's how. I discovered that movie uh, fucking robot from India where the guy fucking magnetized all the rifles to him. It's fantastic shit. God, that movie's fun. Then people just start fucking dropping like flies. Well, the sheriff comes and he's like, you know, everybody else is pretty much dead and uh, he fucking comes up right behind Bloody Benton and fucking blows a hole in her. Well, doesn't she take out Kiyomori first because he's like, ha ha, no one can hit me because I have body armor and then she shoots him in the fucking fingers. She shoots him in like the arm and the knees and he falls down and she's like, yeah, this is for Akira and she shoots him in the head and she keeps trying to shoot him but she's out of bullets i think it was kind of like a fuck you since that's what he did to akira no for sure then the sheriff rolls up and shoots bloody benton yeah out of nowhere who doesn't react to the first two shots at all she gets shot twice and her reaction is to throw the gun at him she's like fuck you <laughs> That whole interaction kind of threw me for a loop. I mean, I get it that that guy was always in for himself like throughout the whole movie, but I never got the indication that he was like that much of an asshole. Well, he's crazy schizophrenic, but it also pissed me off because like here you have like this legendary ass person and this is how she goes out. I thought because she didn't react to the first two shots, I thought she was playing us and had some kind of armor on, but nope. Nope, she's fucking dead. Yep, she gets shot a third time, goes down, and then the, um, I don't know who the fuck this, what was his name again? Toshio. Toshio appears and he shoots the sheriff who goes down. Well, they kind of shoot each other a bunch first yeah everybody starts to kind of go down here and then like toshio and ruriko they kind of die holding hands i think like she says like no one's come to say bloody benton before yeah and he goes no no one ever has you're ruriko which is pretty cool and then he dies like right before he gets to grab her hand the fucking sheriff stands up seemingly okay and then gets this took me a second to process he gets fucking he gets fucking scorpioned with a uh a fucking <laughs> grave crucifix a, a wooden one i thought Thought fucking Uncas from Last of the Mohicans showed up and fucking 86 his ass. <laughs> and then the sheriff finally says something in Japanese, which I fucking didn't write down. Yeah, what the fuck? The whole movie. I didn't even catch. I I, I didn't even catch that. I, I thought he was just speaking in you know broken English again. No no no. He's he speaks a line of Japanese and then fucking dies. And we're fucking laughing our asses off because this is so funny. I mean he he does have a crucifix through his back, so there's that. <laughs> And I believe this is when we're left with just the gunman in uh, Yosuzuna, aren't we? Yeah, this is when the movie officially turns into Kill Bill. You can see Quentin, like, off on the side, just like, Hey, hey, Mike, you know what would be really cool here is if you didn't, like, in the snow? And it just started snowing? Mika's like, it's my movie, Quentin. Quentin's like, play Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, okay? It'll be awesome. Clap, 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 oh, oh God, clap, clap. <laughs> It is pretty awesome, to be fair. I thought it was pretty cool. No, it is cool. <laughs> it's totally cool. Uh, I like how it snows. It starts snowing. And then within 15 seconds... 
it's a complete whiteout. It's like Santa Claus coming to town. I don't I don't care though because like snow is one of my favorite kind of movie aesthetics. So I was like, ooh, I'm all into this now. Does it fucking snow in Nevada? It has snowed a few times here, and apparently it snowed not that long before I moved here. And they're like, it can happen. It just doesn't happen all that often. All right. Well, I'll, fine. I'll give it a pass. Because I was like, wait a second. Realistically, I'm sure when this movie takes place in the real world, snowing in Nevada probably happened a lot. In the 1800s? We're not talking about, like, the Mesozoic. <laughs> I don't fucking... <laughs> or, like, the Ice Age. <laughs> I'm not a meteorologist. <laughs> Global warming, that's why. It's a hoax. It's a big hoax. Then the movie goes full anime. Yeah, but this is fucking sweet, man. The leader of the Genji takes his samurai sword out and he starts running at the gunman and the gunman's shooting at him and he's fucking whacking all the bullets out of the way with the samurai sword and he goes to like strike down the gunman and he like it lands like right in his uh, revolver it's the trigger guard it's like he deflects it with um you know his his revolver yeah but it's like embedded into the revolver basically he hits it right with like the, the trigger guard meets like the chamber so it kind of gets I wouldn't say stuck but it's like it's the perfect place to catch a sword with a gun and then he has like a little gun in his, his little wrist pocket um it's like a little derringer that he pulls out of his sleeve because basically they Get to them the anime standoff where the sword's blocked, the gun's blocked, both guys are in a position where they're stuck. And then this fucking, this Derringer miniature just pops out of his sleeve like Christoph Waltz in Django. The other Django. The other Django. <laughs> and then just fucking shoots him in the face. But you know what's crazy about that? Like, Boss Genji did the same fucking thing earlier in the movie, so shouldn't he have had the same thing? When does he have a little sleeve gun? When he shoots the dude after he got the sword through the head. No, no, no. He pulled, that's what I was saying before. He pulls it out of, uh, He's got a holster, and he, like, fucking does some fancy... Ah, okay. He was... This dude was one of the most... In regards to gunplay and swordplay, that dude is impressive. Dude, he's badass. Legitimately impressive, because what he was doing, like, just the movements where he put his sword away, I'm like, that... I would lose three fingers doing that. But that's what I'm saying. Like, I love that shit, and it was so cool to, like, see him do all that. And his and his revolver twirling was, again, Metal Gear Solid. It was it was Revolver Ocelot. It was the... <laughs> You're pretty good! <laughs> it's really cool. Didn't spin it around enough. That would have been fantastic if he had shot in the face and he's like hey you're pretty good so he shoots him in the head and he dies the next day they bury Hihachi's mother the gunman takes like a handful of gold and he gives the rest to uh Hihachi and he gives him a gun and the rest of, and the rest of the gold um and then he's like yeah he's like you got all the money and you got a gun like do something with your life and then he leaves and that's it the epilogue text is like and then he jangoed good night first Hihachi goes he just says love powerful man that was so powerful but yeah then he, it totally says that he went to italy and was known as django he went to italy and he grew up to be franco nero the end <laughs> <laughs> this little japanese boy did he get like surgery on his face like that guy from the end of the second season of fargo the little japanese boy grew up to be an italian actor no he he also well he also grew up to be joseph gordon levitt's character from sin city 2 my fucking brain hurts talking about this movie dude this movie's hard to discuss because this is not this isn't something you can just look at someone and go, here, this is what this movie's about. I would go out on a limb and say that there's probably only one thing like this, and it's probably the good, the bad, and the ugly. And even then, th I, I haven't seen that movie in a long time. I'm not sure if I finished it. That movie's more on the rails. L quite literally on the rails. <laughs> it would probably be a fair comparison, but at the same time, like that wouldn't do it justice to try to explain it to someone that way just because of the it, absurdity of it. But because the narrative technique is all... It's an idea I'm sure no one's thought of before. But then you watch it, you're like, I mean, this is probably an original idea. Maybe not a great one. It's unique, but the execution is fucking butts. It sucks because this movie comes alive for its third act, and I was really enjoying it. But everything leading up to it is like, what is happening? And even by the end of it, I was like, I don't know what's happening, but this is fun. It's not compelling. That's the problem. I don't give a shit about any of these characters. I don't know what the fuck happened in Izo, but I was into it the whole time. Yeah, Shizuke, like... When she dies, I thought that was sad, and, like, when Akira dies, I thought that was, like, sad, and it was done well, but, like, everybody else I just don't give a shit about. Like, eh, I like the Blade Benton. I liked Sheriff up until, like, his last scene. No, I like him, too, but, like, it's just kind of, they're kind of just, they're still just throwaway characters, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I, I could see where you're coming from. I'm not emotionally invested in any of them. No, not at all. I can say, like, Blade Benton was awesome, and that was cool, because she shot a bunch of dudes. Other than that, I could give a shit. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way, and it's... Because you have all these Japanese actors who are speaking English, are they speaking English phonetically? I don't, it's, I, I thought it's, I thought someone, well, like, sometimes the, the results are disastrous. And you need subtitles. I guess that'd be the easiest way to sound it out, though. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, just think about if you were, if you were an actor and you're native, like, you know, I think you guys said it earlier, like, if it was the reverse, like, yeah, there's going to be some actors that actually know how to speak the language, and I'm sure, like, native speakers will still say, well, well, he speaks it better, but it's still, like, not accurate. And then there's going to be the guy that's literally stumbling through his lines because it's like, this isn't what he does on a regular basis. Yeah, like, if you take the leader of the Genjis and compare him to the fucking riffraff from the beginning of the movie, like, 
it's night and day. Like, obviously, one guy can speak way better English than the other one, and it's to the benefit of the movie. Yeah, like, I, I feel like, the, at least in my opinion, the people that, like, the actor, actresses that were good in this were, you know, Shizuka was good, the gunman was good, Bloody Benton was good, the sheriff was good, and then, like, the leaders of the two gangs, like, the Genji guy, he was very good from, like, an expression standpoint, but I don't think he really nailed, like... He was hard. He was he was hard to understand. Whereas the other guy, you could understand pretty much everything that he said, but it was very like very uh, phonetic, very uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like ham fisted. But you knew what he was saying. No, I think I think that's the word you're looking for. The the phonetic way to be saying that. You know, like he said seesaw. You know, they are leaning against the syllables pretty hard. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you were saying, Joe. That it, you know, not to keep repeating myself, but like. You know, that it probably would be better in Japanese, but for the sake of argument, because it's not, I can't hold that aspect of the movie against the actors, at least. Like, against the director, sure. Yeah, it's it's a weird creative decision that sometimes produces some comedy, and sometimes you're like, what? So what do we think about this? Where Where is this in the dumpster, guys? Um, I, It's funny, you uh, you said something earlier that made me think exactly how it's going to work this. This is a uh, bag of combos that's been half-eaten. It's somewhere in the middle. But and, I'm sorry, not combos, not combos. Check mix. Check mix. There we go. This movie is a little bit of everything. I was gonna say I've never found a combo I didn't like. <laughs> I'm gonna agree with that. Uh, with that, I just wish there was more of those little rye breads in there because those are my favorite. Personally, I wish they were all just snickerdoodle because I'm fat. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a savory mix guy. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't hate this movie, but I certainly will forget everything about it by tomorrow unless I rewatch it. I don't hate it either, and I've already forgotten. Izo might be the last Takashi Mika movie I watched all the way through. Izo is profoundly confusing and there's no assisting context along the way you just kind of like you just you're grabbed by the face and goes come along for a ride and you do and at least this is not as hard to follow as that i'll tell you a story that that will explain my feelings about this movie so say you go to white castle and you don't eat meat and so you order some veggie burgers you order some fish sandwiches possibly maybe some french fries and you get to the window and you're handed your meal, and you say, thank you, White Castle, thank you so much, and you get home, and you open up that, and you just, you're so ready for that, for that burger in your mouth, and you go and you take a bite, and it's fucking barbecue bacon, and you just, you want to throw up, because you're so disgusted by it. That's a story that actually happened. I would say this sounds, uh, this sounds like there's some emotional investment. But it also describes my feelings about this movie. I enjoyed it, but it was not what I wanted at all. All those flavors sound fucking delicious, and then it's just like, what? You fucked up the recipe. You know, you put vinegar in in the uh, in the cake. So you know, where would that be in the dumpster? You know, well, when I got the wrong order, it went right in the bottom of the dumpster. But you know, realistically, this is probably somewhere in the middle, right next to. Uh, well, I don't know if I'd say it's next to Equilibrium. It might be a few fucking uh, old bagels further down. I'm not even touching this fucker. Like, I saw it, and I was like, and I took a sniff, and I was like, eh, pass. I'm good. So that's it. That's Sukiyaki Western Django, directed by Takashi Miike from 2007. If you want some more bad movie goodness, you can check us out at moviedumpsterpodcast.com. Follow us at Movie Dumpster on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also check out our sister podcast, The Phantom Zone, hosted by our very own Connor McGraw. You can find them at phantomzonepodcast.wordpress.com. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor McGraw. Thanks for visiting the dumpster. The name's Henry. <laughs>